be in the book of James this morning, the book of James chapter number one. And as it's been uh, mentioned by several already, it is good to have the Martins and Hoovers with us, uh, back with us as they've gotten back from Mongolia. I encourage you, if you're not fr Facebook friends with Brother Joel, to look him up and you can see some of the work that got done. And, and I think he got done about everything he planned to this time, which if you've ever done any contracting work is a miracle in, in and of itself because you always overexpect of yourself. But uh, no, they got a lot done and it was in encouraging to see. Now, it was funny and I've not, I don't know if I've told anybody this in here or not, but about the time that, uh, that, that they went to Mongolia, uh, when you, of course, you know, we talked about it a lot at church and Hannah and I had talked about it at home, but uh, Joshua kept talking about the monsters and goovers. And we're trying to figure out what the monsters and goovers are. And, you know, so we start questioning on it. And then he said something about Mongolia. And then it clicked the Martins and Hoovers going to Mongolia to do some work. So uh, I'm thankful he was listening. And, uh, you know, so the, mo the monsters and goovers. But anyway, if you found your place in the book of James chapter 1, if you'll, if you'll stand with me, we'll begin reading in verse number 22 and read down through the end of the chapter. And the Bible says in the book of James chapter number one and starting in verse 22, it says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth, and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and uh, continueth therein, he being, uh, not a, or he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man uh, among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this uh, man's religion is vain. In verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for being good to us. We thank you for uh, allowing us to be in your house, to gather together once again, and to be able to have the freedom to look at your word, to be able to study your word, and to be able to do so freely and openly, Lord. And Lord, this morning, I ask that you be with us, that you clear our hearts and our minds and help us to focus on you and your word. And Lord, I ask this morning that you allow me to be your vessel to, have, to lead me to say the things that I should, Lord, and uh, bring back the recollection of the, of the study and the things that, uh, that uh, you would have me say this morning. And Lord, I, I ask that you be in children's church and be with them as well. We love you in Christ's name we pray, and amen, and you may be seated. Religion is something that uh, in the day and age we live in has become, if we want to be honest, a dirty word. There's all kinds of catchphrases around the saying, uh, uh, such as, and maybe I've been guilty of them before, but it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship, which is true to, to an extent. Uh, but what we'll also, whenever someone gets hurt, because unfortunately, people get hurt in churches. Sometimes the church isn't good. Sometimes somebody just makes a mistake. It can be a variety of things, but we'll, we'll reach out to them and say, it wasn't Jesus who hurt you, it was religion. And, all the, and while all of that may be true, my question for you this morning is, is religion a bad thing? I remember, uh, it's been several years ago now, uh, I was having a conversation. There was a co-worker and I who, after we would get off work, we, I worked basically a second shift at the time. And a lot of times we'd get off work around midnight. And he and I would go to the gym sometimes and we would work out. And, and, uh, I, and I would start using it as an opportunity to witness to him. And this man uh, uh, would wear a shirt from time to time that said uh, that had the saying on it. And I always found it interesting. It said, how is it that there's enough religion in the world to start wars, but not enough religion to end wars? And I thought that was such an amazing, it was such a uh, profound thought, if you will. If you, whether you look back throughout the history at the holy wars or even today, how uh, in the Middle East, if we want to get down to the crux of the issue, it's because you have two different groups of people. You've got the Jewish people, which 
some are religious, some are not. And the, and the Muslim people who, are, uh, who want to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the earth because of religion. So uh, religion is viewed up as a, ne- as a negative thing around our world, and I understand why. If we look back at our, uh, in the book of James, chapter number 1, and go back just a couple of verses from where we began, we find in verse 20 that it says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So we find that, uh, that, if w- w- that whenever we run into issues with, with religion, uh, oftentimes it's because of the wrath of man. The, the Bible tells us that we should be slow to anger. I don't know about you, but uh, I do. One of the things that I find amazing as a parent, now I've only been a parent for, for it'll be four years next Tuesday. Joshua will be four years old. You know, and, and I find some of the things amazing and uh, how right now his mind is like a sponge and he wants to uh, soak everything up. But there's also things that can drive you crazy. And if you've been a parent, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about in just a moment. One of the things is how... I didn't have to teach him to be selfish. You know, there are a few ladies in this church who make sure and spoil my kids rotten. And I, and I, and I am grateful for that. But one of the things, it'll be funny, uh, sometimes on Sunday night especially, he'll come in, he'll, ma- he'll make his rounds with the, the ladies in the church that he knows is, there's a good chance anyway they're going to give him something. because he's, he's figured that out. And he'll, walk out, and he'll walk out of church with his arms full of toys and candy and, 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 you know, and newspapers like he loves anything. But anyway, he'll walk out arms full asking me to help him carry his stuff. We'll get in the car, and I'm going to be honest with you all, on Sunday night, we usually go out to eat because if not, it's 9 o'clock when we get home. The boys don't want to eat, and it's a disaster. So we'll go somewhere, and we'll go to whether it's McDonald's or Sonic or something like that, and... And sometimes, one of the things we do when we go to McDonald's is we don't get Happy Meals, but we'll get the 20-piece and split between, uh, you know, a lot of times Hannah and the boys will split the 20-piece, and it's enough for, for them. But without a doubt, or without question, every time we go to McDonald's, the first question is, am I going to get a toy? And whenever you tell him, no, you're not getting a toy this time, it upsets him. And you're like, Joshua, you look, you, your lap is full of toys right now that you just got. But it's not enough. Why? Because naturally, we're selfish people. And that causes issues. It causes issues with our religion. Now, when we look at Jesus and the life of Christ, we find that when he was here on the earth, he attacked the religious crowd of the day. You know, it was whenever the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and I won't go into a, 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 a in-depth history if you want that. Uh, just ask Brother Robert after the message. But in the 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew, uh, you, you find, because in the Old Testament, you don't have the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Herodians, and so on and so forth. That was something that came to be during those 400 silent years. And whenever they, whenever they got to... Uh, whenever they, they, we, you get to the book of Matthew, these people are on the scene. And whenever John is uh, baptizing people and telling them that Jesus is coming, he's calling them a generation of vipers and saying all kinds of negative things about him. Then when Jesus comes on the scene, they're attacking him. To me, one of the strangest verses in the Bible to me is in the book of John, chapter number 3, when Nicodemus goes to Jesus... And at night, because he doesn't want to lose his position, and I, and I understand that. I'm, I'm not trying to make uh, Nicodemus out to be the bad guy. I think he's in heaven today. But he goes to Jesus by night, and one of the first things he says is that we know you're of God because of the things that you do. And we, in that instance, is the Pharisees. So the religious crowd knew that Jesus was of God. And yet, what did they try to do to him, his entire ministry? They tried to kill him. That's one of the strangest verses. That's right up there with whenever 
Herod hears that there's been a king born, and then he goes to the scribes and asks the scribes, where is, he, where is this king going to be born? And they look it up. They search the scriptures. They find that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And what do the scribes do? They close their books, and they go home and go back to bed. You've just been told that the Savior has been born, and you're not curious about it? It's, it's all very interesting to me, but Jesus, as, as his ministry continued, those were the people that he attacked. You know, it wasn't when he got to the temple and saw that how they had tried to make the temple for profit with the money changers selling the animals and so forth. They had, uh, they had perverted the sacrifice and all those things. It was the religious crowd that Jesus chastised. It was those who were at the temple. So again, I ask, is religion a bad thing? Jesus went on to call them vipers. Uh, and, and, and he constantly condemned them. So, is religion the problem? Let's look at the Bible. First of all, I want us to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 5. And because one thing that we hear from many preachers and churches today is that we ha is, is that the law is of no effect. Now, Jesus did fulfill the law. I want to I make that clear. But that we live under grace. I, w I uh, shared this story yesterday, and I've shared it from the pulpit before. But I was at this, uh, this church, a Baptist church at that, and this, the pastor of this church was someone in the Southern Baptist Co Convention. Uh, I, I don't remember his exact title, but he was uh, higher up there. And I'll never forget, we get to a point in the service where he looks at the, uh, looks at the crowd and says, God does not want you to change. God does not ask for you to change. And that just blew my mind because this was a pastor who uh, was pastoring a very large church, I'll go ahead and say that, and is telling you that God does not ask you to change which I find very interesting. They'll say that we live under grace and that, and that grace covers the multitude of sin, and that is correct. But that doesn't mean that we're, that we're permitted to sin. As a matter of fact, the, the Apostle Paul says, God forbid. But anyway, we're in the book of Matthew, chapter number 5, and verse 17 uh, says, this is Jesus speaking, says, Think not that I, that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not to come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So when Jesus came, it wasn't to get rid of the law, or it wasn't to destroy the law. It wasn't to just throw it out the window. It was to fulfill the law, but it wasn't to just get rid of religion altogether. And moving on quickly, the next thing that we see is that Jesus himself was religious. Turn with me to the book of Luke. Book of Luke, chapter number 4. And starting in verse 16, we'll read, but we, we find what, what, a little bit of what Jesus' routine was. We find where he was uh, at the time and what he was doing. In, a ver in Luke, chapter 4, in verse 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and, and as, as his custom was, there you go. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet uh, Isaiah, or Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captivities and recovering sight to the blind, to set, for, set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all men in the synagogue were fastened upon him. Now, Jesus calls a big stink in the synagogue here because he just said uh, that he just said that he is the son of God. But we're not going to focus on that part this morning. But what we find in verse number 16 is that Jesus went to Nazareth, to the synagogue, as his custom was. So on Saturday, because the Sabbath day, you want to know where Jesus was? At church. Not, not that they call it a church. He was in the synagogue. And what was he doing? 
reading the scriptures. We find in other places that uh, that he was called rabbi. We've already referenced the verse, but if you if you want to, you can look at the book of John, chapter number three, and verse number two, and it says, uh, we'll back up to verse number one. The book of John, chapter three, again, very well-known scripture, one of the most well-known passages in all of the Bible. And it says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Again, to me, this is a very strange verse in the Bible because it tells you that the Pharisees weren't doing things um, correctly. But that's not what I want to focus on here. But what did Nicodemus call Jesus? He called him rabbi and a teacher. Now, rabbi means my master or teacher or sage. Now, and in, in the day of the Bible, it's believed that it was a more informal term, but later it becomes a more formal term for a leader of the Jews. But at any rate, uh, he was religious enough that a Pharisee who, and in this case, Nicodemus, was not trying to trip him up. Oftentimes, whenever you come to verses like this, the Pharisee who is there is trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to make him say something that would, um, would, that would make him either be charged with blasphemy, which he does several times, because, but it's not blaspheming if you are God, uh, or to try to get him to contradict the law. Now again, he's God, he wrote the law, he's not going to contradict the law. But uh, at any rate, we find here where Nicodemus uh, uh, comes to him and calls him a rabbi and a teacher, at, not, not to butter him up, but to ask a sincere question. So, if Jesus was religious, is religion bad? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say no, but there are caveats to that. Not all religion is bad, but religion can be bad. Religion is also how cults get started. Religion is, is how uh, false gospels that happen and, and, and on and on. But to rubber stamp and say that all religion is bad, I believe would be inaccurate, inaccurate to say. But because as we read in, in the book of James chapter 1, the word, and we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get back to there eventually, but it talks about true religion. And that is what our goal should be, is for true religion, not just what is going on now. You see, I mentioned earlier that during the 400 silent years, we had the, a stacking, a shaking up, if you will, and a politi uh, politization of, <clears throat> of religion at that time. That's whenever you have your different sex form, as, as, as far as the Pharisees, Sadducees, and again, uh, th there are some others, but that is the main two that are referenced throughout the scripture. And, there, and, and of the law, the Old Testament law, there are 613 laws. But now during the, those 400 silent years, the Pharisees, to be closer to God, because to them it was about their acts, not about their true faith. As Pastor's been talking about on Wednesday night, if you've been here, uh, one of the things is all those who were already saved, when they saw Jesus, when, uh, when he was on earth, they immediately followed him because they recognized who he was. Maybe not initially, but they knew there was something special. So when they saw him, they, they knew to follow him. But, but during that time, there were 613 laws, but the, the Pharisees of the day made sure and made those laws stricter. For instance, and I, I failed to write down the exact number, but I know the Sabbath day is one, was one of the uh, laws in the, that where they changed the regulations and uh, essentially cut the distance that they were allowed to travel in half. Whenever you find Jesus sharing the story of the Pharisee and the publican who are in the temple and the Pharisee praying out loud and saying and, and talking about his accomplishments of how he tithes of all of his possessions and how he... And how he uh, uh, fast three times a week, and just all about all the good things he does. And then he ends it with, er, and he talks about how, thank God I'm not as this publican. Because you see, the Pharisee had religion, but not the right religion. His religion was through his works. And can I tell you, there are a lot of people, I hope that none of you in here are like this this morning, that think that, that the works matter. 
They think that it's, it's how much work they put in, how much money they put in the offering plate, how much time they put, uh, put into going before God, and they think that that's going to win them brownie points. But it didn't for the Pharisees, and it doesn't for us today. There are, uh, there are religions uh, that, will, that will tell you that you have to spend X number of times share, sharing the gospel. I know the gospel, I'll put that in uh, parentheses, because the, the, for instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I'll go ahead and say that that is one where it is a time recommendation. I have been with people who are great soul winners that just can't wait to share the gospel with the next person. And, between, and from door to door, whatever the thing is, they're almost running. But if you'll notice, those who are just trying to get a time allowance in for their religion, they, they tend to take their time a little more. So, religion causes problems because, and here's the, and here's the ma uh, major point, religion causes problems because people are the problem. The, the old saying, men at best are simply men at best. Can I tell you this morning, I'm glad you're here. I love our church. I hope you do too. If you're a visitor, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you come back. If you don't like my preaching, come back. Our pastor will be back next week. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, I, I do love our church. But if you decide to leave our church and you find a perfect church, don't join it. You'll mess it up. Because there's no such thing as a perfect church. I hate to say that, but ch churches are made up of imperfect people. And uh, where, where there's imperfect people, there will be issues. But we do find uh, in, in uh, the book of James about true religion. Now, the first, uh, as we go back to the book of James in chapter number 1, I want to uh, look at verse 22 again. And it tells us to be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So the first thing we find is that we are supposed to do the word. Okay, what is the word? Well, we have the word of God in front of us. It tells us how, well, the things that we're supposed to do. Now, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the points that the Bible makes several times, if you will, turn with me to the book of Galatians, chapter number 3. Well, one thing that we find in the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 3, is that we cannot keep the law. Again, the book of Galatians chapter number 3 and uh, verse 10 tells us, to the intent that now unto the uh, principalities and powers in heavenly places, I'm in the wrong, wrong book, I apologize, I was in Ephesians, uh, Galatians chapter 3, helps when the preacher's in the right place. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 10 says, For as many as are under the, uh, un I'm sorry, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For his written curse is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law. In the sight of God it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So we find in Galatians chapter 3 that the law uh, that does not justify us in the sight of God. If, there, if one of you in here wanted to go through the, the Old Testament, go through the Torah, go through the books of uh, uh, especially Le Leviticus and De Deuteronomy and try to keep those laws, you're going to fall, fall short. One of the examples that I like to go to, and I apologize if you're sick of hearing it, but if, if, the, if a broad jumper convinced himself that he was going to jump the Grand Canyon at its widest point without any help, it doesn't matter how much training he does. It doesn't matter uh, 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 what diet he goes on, how, uh, how far he can run, or the head start that he gets. None of that matters because he, he could be the best broad jumper in the world, but as soon as he takes that leap to try to jump the Grand Canyon, he's going to come nowhere near crossing it. And it is the same when we try to please God by our works. There is not enough that we can do. Not even closely. Now, if we look in the book of James, in chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible tells us, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So, 
Well, we could we could take the law, and we could just take the Ten Commandments. We'll we'll shorten it down to the Ten Commandments. And where the Bible uh, and where the Bible tells us the Ten Commandments say, "Thou uh, thou shalt not covet." I'll I'll go with that one because that one is a very hard one not to break because, again, we're people, and if we're going to be honest, we're very material, most of us anyway are very materialistic people, and we see somebody with something nice, or I'll be honest, one of the things I see is someone on a, you know, random weekday uh, with their, you know, $100,000 truck hooked up to their uh, $200,000 boat on their way to the lake, and I'm like, now how did they do that? Now, I'm not actually uh, coveting that because that's so far uh, unattainable for me. I know I'm not going to get there. But we, see, but we look around, and if we're not careful, we do see how people's lives are going, and if we'll be honest with ourselves, we get on uh, social media, as so many of us do, and we see people's lives, which they only post the good things about, and it's like we see how well things are going for them. We're like, why is it my life isn't going like that? And we begin to want more, and we begin to leave God out of it. And then by breaking that law, oftentimes we're also putting, uh, putting another God in front of Jehovah, our God. So there we're, we're, we're already breaking two commandments. And the Bible tells us, there in the book of James chapter 2, that if you offend the law in one part, then you've broken the whole law. You cannot keep the law. So what does the Bible mean when it says to do the word? Well, in, we, we, uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Levit Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7 is God speaking. And he says, be ye holy for I am holy. And we find that same, uh, that same phrase in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 15 to 16 where, where Peter writes, but as uh, he which hath called you holy, uh, call, I'm sorry, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay, so if we live under, the, under grace, and grace covers a multitude of sin. Again, we do live under grace, and grace does cover a multitude of sin. But if the way we live doesn't matter because God forgives of our sins, then why does he tell us, even in the New Testament, quoting the Old Testament, to be holy? We find in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, a very well-known passage of Scripture. Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through, uh, through 36. This is one of those times when the, Pharisee, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees are all trying to trip Jesus up. In verse 34, we find uh, where the Pharisees didn't like that the Sadducees couldn't get the job done. And it says, but when the uh, Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? So again, they're trying, just trying to trip Jesus up. This isn't like Nicodemus. They're trying to trip Jesus up here. And he says, and Jesus said, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So Jesus took the 613 commandments uh, of the Old Testament and reduced them down to two. He said, first of all, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself, it would take care of itself. You wouldn't have to worry about it. If that's truly how, if we lived our lives that way, then as you're out uh, in, about in the world, and if I were to get guess here this morning, there's probably a lot of you, like myself, that sometimes tend to have a lead foot. And if we got our love for God correctly, then we would be able to keep the laws of the land and be able to drive at the posted speed limit. Because that law wouldn't matter. Because we would have no thought about it because we would already be willing to do so. But yet, but yet that's not the way we behave so often times. But if we love, love God the right way, then religion would be easy. In uh, in, in verse 26, 
of James chapter uh, of James chapter one, a verse that we've already read, but we find something that uh, something I find interesting. I'll explain after we read. If any if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So now we're talking about the tongue. We'll talk more about that tonight. So come back if you want to hear more on the power of the word. But anyway, we find where if a man claims to be religious, but can't keep his mouth under control, then his religion's vain, and he and he's deceiving himself. Now, I'm not calling into question that person's salvation, but I do know this. There's been a couple times, and I'll stick with this I'll go, I'll go with this illustration. I don't want to take too much of your time. I want to be mindful of the time and not be like Pharaoh, but let God's people go. But I had a coworker, and uh, those of you who don't know, uh, I, I drive a truck for a living. Now, if you don't know what truck drivers do, they talk on the phone all day. If you, if you, if you want to get in on some juicy gossip, get to know truck drivers. You shouldn't gossip, though. So, but, uh, that, that's, uh, but truck drivers have nothing better to do than to ride down the road, talk on the phone all day. And I was talking to another one of my co-workers as we're both out driving. And I saw a window to begin to witness to this man. Now, this, this man, I would go ahead and say, I thought, or I thought to be a person with a good heart. But nothing in his life pointed me to him being a Christian. He you know, had a foul mouth, the things that he talked about. Um, it, 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 just nothing about this man struck me as being a Christian. And as I began to witness to him, he shared his testimony with me. He grew up in the Northeast as a Catholic. And he said that he went to a Bible study one night, and he, he said he had never heard of them. I think he called the group Reformed Catholics. Um, I, I, I don't remember that for sure, but there was something Catholics. And he said, as they're, go, as they're at this Bible study, the man leading the Bible study, he says that, that you needed to accept Jesus to be saved. Now, I didn't know any Catholics believe, believed that kind of doctrine and believed salvation was that simple, but that's what this man taught. And the man that I was speaking to speak, said that he spoke up and said, that sounds like some kind of holy roller stuff. So the man leading the Bible study said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I don't really know. It's just something I heard my dad say, and it kind of stuck. So the man went through the gospel. He went through the road to Romans and explained how that one could be saved. And he said, when he finished, I was sitting there, and before he even asked, he said, I told him, that's exactly what I need. He accepted Jesus Christ as the Savior. And then he told me, he said, uh, that he sings in the choir at his church. And that, um, uh, but that he, he sings in the choir at his church. And then he did follow it up and say, I know the way I talk. And he said, that's one thing that I've not been able to get rid of. And that's all, that conversation has always baffled me because to me, he gave me a true, a, a true testimony where, it, it, you know, if everything's true there, and, I'm, and I believe it was, I believe the man is saved and on his way to heaven. But yet he can't keep his mouth, his tongue under control, which is not biblical. And it, and it really bothers me because the verse that we just read, it says that he deceiveth his own heart and, and says that this man's religion is vain. But yet so many people that you meet today are just like that. I was on social media, and I don't know who it was. It was shared. It was some politician, celebrity, I don't know, somebody who has a large following, was given a gift, a sign to hang in their office or home or whatever, that said, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. And the reason I saw it is someone else had shared it, and I don't remember if it was this verse they quoted, but talked about how if you love Jesus, you shouldn't cuss a little. You're, you're every, everything that comes out of your mouth should be uplifting and glorifying to God. And if you struggle with a foul mouth, that is not uplifting to God. And so I went to the comments under that post, and just about every comment was from Christians defending this person's right to cuss. 
Now, that's between you and God. I'm just trying to point to what the Bible says. But it bothers me that that is a common belief among American Christians. But one thing we find uh, as we look at this is what happens when we fake religion. Go back up with me to to verse 22 of James chapter 1. The last part of the verse says, uh, in the middle of the verse says, "And And not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his face, uh, his natural face, in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man that he was. So, you know, there's some people that they get up in the morning, they look themselves in the mirror, and think that they are the best looking thing to ever walk the earth, even though everyone else sees them, and they're like, I don't know what, I don't know what you see in yourself. But they've deceived themselves, and whenever we only hear the word, but we don't apply it to our heart. We begin to think, I'm a good person. I'm doing the right things. You know, a a lot of, and I'll go ahead and say, a lot of American Christianity, I'm afraid, is like this because they want to read the Bible. They go to church to, to feel good. But then whenever they walk out the door, they apply nothing to their heart. Like the pastor I said earlier, they may be even be of the belief that God does not ask you to change, which is a lie. God actually tells you to change. He tells you to try to be more like Christ. He tells you not to be like the world, not to conform to the world. But in the, but in the day and age we live in, that is not what, what people want to see. So, but they forget who they actually are. They forget the, the truth of the gospel and that we're all sinners on our way to a devil's hell without Jesus. And they begin to puff themselves up And they begin to uh, be like the Pharisee, because I think that if you want, if you want my honest opinion, is that the Pharisees read the law, knew the law, memorized the law, tried to apply the law, and but they but they allowed no change in their heart, so therefore they became puffed up. They deceived themselves with who they really are. They thought that my works are enough. I'm better than those people over there who are doing the wrong thing, because. So much of the gospel goes back to a heart issue. It goes back to a heart issue. And as we've already read in Galatians, that the law can't justify you. It has to be a change here. It has to be God. It has to be faith that does that. And at times, we deceive ourselves with how good we actually are. Kind of like, you know, if you've ever said, you know, I'm going to lose weight, and you get up, and you work out, or you go to McDonald's, but you get a Diet Coke instead, and you feel good about yourself, or I've I've seen people who are wanting to get in shape, and they go to the gym, they work out, and like, man, I feel good about myself. Let's go get some ice cream, and just undid the entire workout that they did. Anyway, but, uh, but that's what it is whenever we are hearers only of the word. Now, I'm not foolish enough to think that everyone in here is going to take a message from God or they're going to read their Bible or, and, they, and they're going to apply it. But, so, but I, I know that there are going to be a lot of hearers that, again, and I hope this isn't you, but you come to church because it's Sunday. You should be in church. It'll make you feel better. There's, there's a lot of churches today that will uh, have a TED Talk. They'll have a feel-good message and you know maybe a little Bible sprinkled in. I don't know. And the people will leave there feeling good about themselves. There's many churches that preach a prosperity gospel that, hey, you came to church, you're, do, you're doing well, and uh, so much of their message is, is focused around what you deserve and how you deserve a, to live a blessed life. But yet that's not what we find. They're deceiving themselves. And what's the end whenever they deceive themselves? One of the things that I worry about as a parent is what my kids see in me. And I, and, I, and I hope that doesn't come across as me trying to lift myself up. But I want my kids to see true religion in me. Yeah. I want them to, and, I, and I, I don't want them to see, well, he says this, but he does this. Or I don't want them to see me whenever there's a rule there, going all the way up to the rule and not going over because it's going to encourage them to go over the line. And it's all because of fake religion. 
When, you, when your religion is incorrect, you will mislead yourself and others. One of the more interesting questions that, that, that I love to ask people is, you know, are you saved? Are you on your way to heaven? You know, that opens all kinds of cans of worms. But if they say yes, my, I love the follow-up question of, why are you going to heaven? What makes it to where you are going to heaven? And over the years, I have heard a lot of answers to that question. I've heard some good answers, you know, that lay out the gospel. But I've also, but oftentimes what you'll hear is, I, I'm a good person. I live a good life. I was baptized. And all these things. But unfortunately, if that's what they're relying on, they've deceived themselves. And they'll split hell wide open. If you're here this morning and that's the way you're looking... I don't want, I'm not trying to scare you. If I could, I would, but I'm not trying to. But if your faith is in anything other than Jesus Christ, you'll split hell wide open. The next thing that, that I want to point out is in verse 27. Pure religion and under, uh, the pure religion undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. So, true religion, pure religion, is not about you. And that's hard for us. Because naturally, like I said with my oldest, love him to death. But is that we're selfish, naturally. And we don't like inconveniencing ourselves to help others. Last night, we always pray with our boys before they go to bed. And last night, while we were praying, one of the things that I prayed for, and it's a prayer that I try to make often, is to be a blessing to someone else. And after, we finished, after I finished praying, Joshua said, who's someone else? And, you know, I, I find it interesting. I, I love what they pick up on because, you know, there was a lot more to the, to the prayer than help me to be a blessing to someone else. But his question was, who's someone else? And, ha and uh, Hannah actually was the one who answered the question. I guess I was a little too uh, confused because sometimes we assume our kids know more than they do, which is a problem. But, uh, um, uh, but she explained to him, to be a blessing to someone else is... To be a, is to try to help someone else out when it doesn't affect you. You know, it's easy to help someone when you're getting something in return. You know, uh, most of you uh, tomorrow morning when your alarm clock goes off, you'll get up, maybe a few minutes later after you hit the snooze button, and you'll go to work and you'll do your job, not because you love your job, but because you need a paycheck. Work is easy for that reason because you like to eat, and if you don't work, you don't get to eat. But being a blessing to someone else, when it doesn't affect you, is much more difficult. Because it inconveniences your schedule. It takes money out of your pocket, and it doesn't help you in any earthly way. It, 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 it's more difficult to do, but pure religion is, is selfless. And that's the way that we ought to go through this life is helping others when we have nothing in it for ourselves. Some bi a couple of Bible examples, and I promise I'm finishing up. But we find uh, Elisha after he's been living by the brook, and God tells him to go and he would find a widow woman, and uh, and that uh, she would keep him up. And when he gets to this woman. He, she's gathering sticks with her son, and, he's, and he asks her to, he asks her for some food. And she turns to go, and then she turns back and says, Sir, I only have enough food to make one hot cake, putting it in modern day terms, to make one hot cake. Me and my son, we're going to split it, and we're going to die. Because that's all we have. Have you ever put yourself in Elisha's shoes there? You know, you're a man, 
coming to a widow woman with a child, first of all, you're asking her for help. And then when she tells you that she's going to eat it and die because she doesn't have enough, he tells her, well, make me some first anyway. Now, I believe he had great faith in God, but to me, from the human perspective, I'm like, that is crazy. There is no way I, could have, I would have said, I'm sorry to bother you and tried to figure out some way to help her myself. That's a me problem, though. Elisha listened to God. And that lady listened to God. She gave up her last meal to help Elisha. That's pretty unfathomable to me, but... And now again, don't try to be a blessing to someone for this reason. But God made sure she was taken care of until the famine was over. And as it's been said, I believe every day when she went back to get more, I don't think that the the container that she kept the meal in, I don't think it was full. I don't think it was three quarters, half. I don't think it was a quarter full. I think she was scraping the bottom every time she went in there. And every time she went to pour the oil, I think she was more like, you know, the first couple of days especially. I don't think there's anything in here, but as she began to pour it, there was just enough every time. And then we find in the New Testament, one of my favorite um, miracles because uh, it's actually the only miracle that, that appears in all four Gospels. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And you find where they're trying, where Jesus asked the disciples. Now, of course, Jesus knows what he's doing. But he asked the disciples, says, we've got all these people here. The Bible tells us 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So there's a lot more than 5,000 people there. And, uh, and he asked the disciples, hey, we've got to feed these people. They're hungry. I'm not going to send them away hungry. And there's a little boy there who, in my mind, his mama packed him his lunch. I don't know if that's what actually happened, but he had his lunch. Now, again, some, some people estimate that there was 20 plus thousand people there. And this little boy has five loaves of bread and two fish. I, and he says, you can have it. Hey, he just gave up his meal. Now, maybe he had faith that Jesus was going to do something with it and he was going to get fed. But in that moment, he gave up his meal not knowing what was going to happen next. But Jesus was able to take those those five loaves of bread, those five rolls, and two fish, and feed 20,000 with leftovers. That's that's pretty amazing. But that was that little boy being a blessing to someone else, not knowing that he was going to get anything in return. Again, it's a matter of the heart. I know all of us sitting in here, if I say that you, that, uh, if I bring up that uh, money with strings attached, somebody probably pops into your mind. Where, yes, they're willing to help you out. If you get in a financial pinch, they will gladly help you out. Because they've got you in their back pocket after that. But that's not what pure religion is either. And I want to finish up with this line of thought. Most, just about everything of what I've said today does not matter if you're here and you're lost. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, then religion is not going to do you any good. You can't be a good enough person. You can't put enough money in the offering plate. You can't be good enough to the pastor or the, uh, to the church or you help enough people. You can't be a good enough parent. You can't be a good enough teacher. Nothing you do will ever be enough. Except for one thing. And that's what you do with Jesus. Because when you get to heaven, you're not going to be, or it, it, you know, if you're saved and when you get to heaven, you're not going to go up to somebody and say, hey, how did you get here? And they're going to say, well, I did. No. They, they will not start with I. It'll be Jesus. Because what Jesus did. Because Je- Jesus loved me enough. Because, I, especially when we get to heaven, I think we'll really realize what low-down, terrible, rotten people the best of us are. But, but when we get to heaven, or but, but to get to heaven, you cannot do enough. But you have to do the first part of do the Word and accept Christ as your personal Savior. You have to 
Believe in what Jesus did on the cross for you. And we'll have a moment of invitation here, here in just a moment. And if you're not, and, and if you want to know how to be saved, hey, we'll point you to somebody that, that doesn't tell you what Jeremy Jones says. They don't tell you what Billy Kirk says, Tom Fittis, what Calvary Baptist Church says. We'll tell you what the Bible says. Because what Jeremy Jones says is worthless if it doesn't agree with the Bible. So, I'll, two questions as we close. First of all, how's your religion? Because you can say all the cute quotes you want about how religion doesn't matter. Yeah, about how it's a relationship. And again, it is all about a relationship. But you're in church this morning, so you've got at least a little bit of religion about you. Do you have that pure religion? Are you a selfless, or selfish person? Is there something that God wants to change in your heart? Because again, like I said, God wants, to, wants you to change. God wants you to have a better relationship with you, and sin will stop you from that. So you've got to change by getting the sin out of your life. And once you do that, you can have that better relation. You can have that pure religion that we've read about this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for being good.